what is the one thing, just the one single thing you could do to help yourself? We would be able to create ways for people to come together and share what they have with those in need. Once he is able to fish, we should teach them how to sell their fish. I'm Elizabeth Gearhart. And I'm Kenya Gibson filling in for Richard Gearhart. And you just heard some excerpts from our Passage to Profit presenters. And stay tuned for more on Passage to Profit. Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we have a really exciting show for you today. So we have Victoria Wick, who's actually coming back a second time in Passage to Profit. She built a half a million dollar business from nothing. So you definitely want to stay tuned for that. And then we also have Valal Abana, who is actually the first originator of the single origin food company. It's the world's first single origin food company. So if you want to know all about where your food's coming from, you definitely want to stay tuned for that. And then listeners, would you take sandwiches into the inner city in the middle of the night and hand them out to the homeless? Especially if you are a beautiful, blonde, tiny woman. Well, we have someone here who does that. (laughs) You want to hear her story for sure. So stay tuned for Jenny DePaul, who's going to be interviewed by Carrie Barrett. So we have a very special guest who's actually returning to Passage to Profit today, Victoria Wick. So Victoria is a world-renowned jewelry designer. She's an author. She's a podcaster, host of the Million Dollar Hobbies, and she's also built a $500 million business from scratch. So Victoria, welcome back to Passage to Profit. Thank you. So good to be back. And I think I did you not due diligence in the intro. I think you I said you built a half a million dollar business. So I just want to make sure we correct that in that it's actually a $500 million business from scratch. So I want to make sure we put that out there correctly. It's only a digit difference, eight <laughs> figures, nine <laughs> figures. <laughs> Such a big deal. It's a lot. It's a lot. Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, I don't actually even think about the money really, because um, when I started, my goal was to, you know, remember, I started with no money. I didn't have money to even make a single sample. So basically, my goal was to be able to make $2,000 a month. But my like, dream scenario would have been 3000 bucks a month. So I didn't even dream about ever owning a home or, you know, buying a new car. I just wanted to just feed my kids and uh, pay my own apartment and pay my car insurance. And, you know, maybe hopefully have a little bit of money saved up for their future. And all I really wanted to do is spend time with them uh, instead of having the nannies, you know, do all that work. So, you know, I kind of overachieved that over those years. So, you know, I don't actually really think about the money that much. Well, Victoria, I, we haven't introduced what kind of business you have, but I think it's amazing that you did this with jewelry because you think of the jewelry business as a very crowded field. Oh, and yeah. to be able to go from zero to half a billion with a jewelry business is amazing. So what are your top tips for entrepreneurs trying to do something like that? Well, I mean, do everything with intention and give it your heart. And you got to really love your customers because when you actually, you know, really get to know them, their issues and you solve their problems, you know, they're going to keep talking about you. They're going to be so emotionally connected with you that they bring in new customers all the time for you. And I think that that is, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, when you chase the money, the money will never come because you're in there for all the wrong reasons. That's a good point because you're saying, you know, you don't focus on the money so much. But I guess it's kind of is, is it not hard to not focus on the money? Because I feel like that's a lot of money to not focus on. So like what do you have to have a certain kind of mindset in terms of like attracting that kind of money into your atmosphere? Like what would you suggest someone does? Like say they only have a thousand dollars in their their bank account to start a business. What's the mindset you need to have in order to kind of grow yourself to believe that you can achieve this multi-million dollar empire? First of all, a thousand dollars is more than what I had to start my business. So that's the good news. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, if you really believe that you have something special, if you really, you know, and you got to believe that because no one else will. I mean, as as you know this, no one else will. So you got to believe in, you know, your ability to solve their problem one person at a time. And when you do that, all these obstacles that are in front of you, like no money, no connections, you know, no experience, all of that, goes out the window because you are going to be creating a whole new way of solving problems for them. So for example, in my jewelry business, I mean, as Elizabeth said, jewelry business, I mean, you can go to uh, China, Africa, Kenya, all these places, and you'll find there's a a Chinese restaurant and a jewelry store. (laughs) Everybody's jewelry store is very, very crowded. 
Um, it's also one that requires a lot of money because you have to have inventory. You know, you got you, you really have to buy in volume, all of that. I didn't have any money. So, you know, I ended up, I believe that uh, Joby at that time in 1989 was sold. Um, and you you guys all know this. I mean, I'm not sure about Pilar, but basically most of us women know Joby is sold on status. Like, you know, oh, I bought this two carat diamond from Tiffany's or whatever. That was always sold on status. It was really never sold on the emotional connection. So when I came into the business, I believe that there was a place for moderately priced jewelry that will make you feel elegant, sophisticated, understated, and makes you feel like, you know, you're somebody special. And because jewelry is bought and sold to, um, you know, create milestone moments, you know, think about, you know, weddings, um, all the, you know, the celebrations. So I created jewelry that will connect you emotionally, that has a feeling to it, that has a look about it. And also a lot of women that went to work in 1989 you know, we were the first generation of women that actually worked in managerial positions. It, women before us worked in, you know, as a receptionist, you know, Girl Friday. They actually had a title called Girl Friday, believe it or not. So when I created jewelry for that working woman who wanted to feel her femininity and who wanted to express a little bit about herself, there was a market for it. And I believe there was a market for it. I just didn't have a way to express it. So I created a lookbook and pretty much designed them on a piece of paper. I then went to all the department stores within 20 mile radius. And I asked the assistant department managers for jewelry departments, you know, I would just tell them, look, I have no experience. You know, I'm, I'm a young girl. I have some dreams of starting my own business. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like really embarrassed to even show you my designs, but would you just like take a, a few minutes and, you know, let me know if there's anything in here that you might, you know, your customers might like. And believe it or not, the first one I talked to was uh, Nemo and Marcus. The woman was like, oh, my God, like, this is beautiful. I mean, uh, you know, our customers would love it. And so they ended up selling them for me. Then I just duplicated the process, like a 30-mile radius all over L.A. So I kind of like got paid before I even got my first sample made. So what I'm saying is don't give up. When people tell you you can't, you're not good enough unless you have a unique selling proposition, you're just not going to make it. The idea that a young Asian woman who barely spoke English can actually get there and do something back then, I got laughed at a lot. But you don't give up. You know, you just have to have some grit and move on. Well, I think you're pretty bold. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. Don't I look like a boxer, that, you know. <laughs> I think that that's one of the takeaways for me is you have to be bold. You can't be afraid to walk into that store up to that person or wherever and just say, look, here I am. Look at me. And it takes guts. I mean, you know, yeah. we're all afraid of rejection, but you just carried on. I just want to say one thing. Rejection is just feedback. When I wrote my first book, I told everybody English is my second language. So it's probably going to be horrible. Okay, I've never written anything before. It's going to be horrible. Uh, everybody told me your first book sucked and mine probably sucks more than others. But I just would like some feedback. And so when somebody, you know, tells you no, uh, what I say, is instead of getting mad or defensive and you leave or you're embarrassed, what I would say is like, you know what? I completely understand why you wouldn't want this, but is there anything you can give me here? Like any feedback would be really appreciated so that, you know, what would it take for me to come back and present this to you again? That's and you'd be surprised how many people actually will give you all their opinions. And a lot of times those opinions, like they suck too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they still like feel like they were heard. And you keep doing that. And what happens is like, you'll, you know, you don't have to sell to everybody you talk to. Look, Babe Ruth, he didn't hit a thousand. If you look at, he was like the best, you know, hitter of all time. He didn't hit 500. So if you get four out of 10, you're Babe Ruth in retail. I need to put that in front of me on like a little plaque because Victoria was saying that rejection is feedback. And I know that you're working on writing a how-to book on the American dream. So I kind of wanted to get your definition of what you think the American dream is or, or what that looks like. You know, I was interviewed um, years ago, five or six years ago about that very question. Um, I did a whole collection of jewelry called American Dream. And it kind of like um, I expressed my journey with jewelry, like, you know, the heart, you know, express like my passion for something. For me, coming from South Korea, where, you know, girls were given up a lot for adoption and you know, aborted and all this stuff. So my parents came here because they had four girls. For me, the American dream was to be able to think one day that, you know, a girl born in South Korea can come to America and even dare to dream about having an American dream, you know, that, that the thought that if you try hard enough, there is, you know, I mean, slim chance, but there is a slim chance that you're, you're going to actually achieve your American dream. 
So my first book, oddly enough, talks about defining the dream. Because a lot of times, when you ask a bunch of young kids, you know, what's your American dream? They constantly talk about money, fame, and money. You know, that actually is the wrong way to go about doing that. I think if you ask people to envision the life they can realistically live, for me, my American dream was to be able to be present for my children. Because when I came to America, I was like 13 years old. I never saw my parents. You know, they went to work the two jobs each. And I know there are millions of American kids today that have the same problem. Now their parents go to work pretty early in the morning, and they come home exhausted at eight o'clock at night or something. My parents didn't come home till like 10. You know, they had a night job where they cleaned offices and all that. So I wanted to be present for my kids. That was my dream life. That meant that if I'm going to be present for my kids, I can't be working a regular job. So I was willing to work longer hours, but not when they were at school. And I was willing to live on lower money, like two thousand bucks a month. I mean, I had an MBA by that point, and most kids, you know, out of MBA school were making like thirty-five, fifty grand a year, just year one. And I was like year three at that point. But what happened is, and this is the lesson: what happens is if you have those core values, and this is why you started your business. I got up at like five o'clock in the morning every morning because、so、my kids went to school about seven forty-five in the morning. So I got up at five. Between six and seven, basically, I called on accounts in Europe. I called Harrods, London, Gallus, Lafayette, Marks and Spencer, all those stores because six a.m. California time is like noon time in England. I did this like you know every day because again, like today, if you were to sell a car, if you were to sell a collection to somebody, you need about. Five to twenty-five touch points. You don't ever sell something day one. So I basically had it, you know, like a journey planned out. So I did this, you know. Lo and behold, I found out that all these、uh, European department stores they love American goods. So I was in Harrods before I opened anything in the U.S. But believe it or not, when I tell like the buyers at Neiman's and Saks, "Hey, I'm in Harrods and Galaxy Lafayette," and they're like, "Oh my God, you know, come on over." So I go to Neiman's. I open Neiman's. And then I went to Macy's and I said, "I'm selling to you know Neiman's down the door." And are you interested? Yeah, of course I'm interested. So this went on and on and on. So a lot of people now ask me, like you know, what were you doing before?、Um, bless you. What were you doing before you got to HSN? Because people believe that I got a big break by going on HSN. That's not true. Actually, HSN called me after they saw my stuff on the cover of so many magazines all around the world. But I worked like from you know six a.m. to about seven seven thirty, and then when they went to school, when I dropped them off about nine o'clock my time, I would start working New York, which is noon. Then you know worked all the way down to you know California time zone. When I picked them up at two o'clock, from two to eight o'clock, I didn't do anything. I didn't answer phones. I didn't ask text. Nothing. But at eight thirty, when they were getting were winding down, going to bed, nine o'clock California time is、uh, noon the next day in Japan, Korea, and all those places. So I opened up all the stores out down there as well. So I had a global distribution before. So if you think carefully about how you want to live your life, you know you got a pretty good chance of because you're so focused on that. You have a real good chance of achieving it, Victoria Wick. That is an amazing story. We will be picking Victoria's brain throughout the show. <laughs> There's a lot there、okay. to pick, so. <laughs> so we'll be right back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR seven ten, the Voice of New York, with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. But our special co-host today, Kenya Gibson, and our wonderful guest, Victoria Wick. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So, if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law. www. www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at g-e-a-r-h-a-r-t-l-a-w.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearheart. My co-host Kenya Gibson today, standing in for Richard Gearhart. We have just interviewed Victoria Wick, and if you missed that interview, 
you can hear it on our podcast that comes out tomorrow. She is amazing. She went from zero to half a billion. Everybody I know would love to do that. But now we have Jenny DePaul. And if you ever wanted to do something to make the world a better place, and you weren't really sure what to do, well, she found something. I mean, this the fact that she does this just blows me away. And we have a special guest interviewer, Carrie Barrett from Carrie Barrett Consulting, who will be interviewing Jenny. So welcome. Oh, thank you for having us. That was an amazing introduction because you're absolutely right, Elizabeth. Jenny is second to none. I've known her for about three years now. And when I first learned about her mission and her vision for the world, you know, we talk about mission, vision, values, but this is somebody who actually lives them every single second of every single day. And so I was excited to bring her on. She is the founder of Project Kind. It is a registered nonprofit. It's based in Rockaway, New Jersey. They focus on homeless outreach. And Jenny is the heart and soul of Project Kind. So thank you for being here, number one. Number two, you want to dive a little bit further into what exactly Project Kind is and who it looks to serve? Sure. My hope with Project Kind from the very beginning was that we would be able to create ways for people to come together and share what they have with those in need and then to go out and serve and to make these connections with people and hopefully inspire them in some way to move forward. So that's what we've been doing for the last really eight years because it started out simply as an outreach that my daughters and I were doing and then it grew from there. Take us back, if you don't mind, a little bit to how that outreach started. I find this so interesting because it was you and your daughters and you were inspired by your son, Kental. It started out as just a how do we live our values sort of thing. So can you take us a little bit further into that? Sure. So early on in my marriage, my family decided to take in foster children. And in doing that, we ended up taking in 15 you know, over a few years. And one of those children, we ended up adopting. His name is Kintel. He came to us when he was one. And at three and a half, he severely regressed. He was given a diagnosis of childhood disintegrative disorder, which is considered very severe autism spectrum. So at that moment, I had to make this decision. Do we adopt him or send him kind of back into the system. And in that moment, I had to think, is this child just as worthy now as he was when he first came to us? And for me, that was a really defining moment in my life, you know, about who am I really? And what does it really mean to live out your truth? So I did adopt him and he is 16 now. And with that, we all just kind of grew so much and learned so much, you know, from him, this child who was nonverbal and who still is nonverbal. I mean, he's 16 and he's made tremendous progress, but you can't discount. This was not a simple, there was going to be some struggles. This was a life changing decision you made. Yeah. 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 And I knew at that moment that it would change everything, but what that would look like, I had no idea. You know, so I just had to go back to what my why was in the beginning and know that I needed to move forward and trust that everything I needed, I would be able to find within me, you know? So we cared for Cantal and we still kept taking in foster children. And at that time we changed who we took in to kids who were considered difficult to please. And that was only because of Cantal. Your experience. Yeah, Yeah. our experience. So at one point I wanted to sit down with my daughters, my biological daughters, and have a conversation about what it meant to live out your truth. You know, what our why was and see where they were at. And during that meeting, we came up with three truths and they were that everyone is worthy of love. Everyone has purpose. And that no matter what your situation is, we all have something to share and give. So we decided to try and live that out outside of our home. So much of that had been focused in our home with the children and my son. So we decided to go into the inner city. And really at that time, it was just spend time with people who maybe needed to be reminded that they were loved. And we ended up at Newark Penn Station and we would bring whatever we had, which really wasn't much, you know, a few peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. If we had a few hats, if it was cold and we would just go and sit and recognize them as people, which many of them have not been recognized for a long time. Right. Yeah. So we would, we etched out some time each week. We would go, we would share our meal with the person sitting next to us get to know their story, you know, and over time we started sharing people's needs on social media. That was the first step in kind of the growth we saw. I would wake up one day and my entire porch would be filled with items that we were asking for. And not even that, like letters to the person whose story maybe we shared. So people were feeling this connection and 
it just was through me sharing it with them, yeah. but they wanted to be a part of that person's journey. So that's kind of where we started. And it was just, again, you know, my family going and then it grew. You sat with people, you recognize them, but it wasn't an immediate process. And I think this is really interesting because a lot of us try something or we feel like it's the right thing to do and it doesn't go exactly how we envision it going in our minds. And so we give up or maybe this isn't the right thing or maybe I'm going to put my efforts elsewhere. So when Jenny has talked to me about this, she said, you know, it took a long time. Like I I couldn't just go sit down next to somebody. Sometimes I would have to spend weeks just trying to elicit like a smile out of somebody by trying to establish eye contact because for so long, people who are in this situation have just been passed by. It's almost like they're not even there. So it started with these very small steps, you know, eye contact, elicit a smile, then maybe here's some food. Now let me sit next to you. And then the biggest one of all is here, you want to talk on a video and let me share it with people. But when you, when people did that, when they had reached that stage, There was something that was completely liberating for them about being able to speak and have people listen, correct? Yeah. So what I've found is people will come to me and ask to share their story. So I feel like for them, it's this opportunity to be seen and heard Mm -hmm. and they haven't been seen in a long time, you know, I mean, because if you think about the person, maybe you see sitting under that bridge or on the sidewalk. I think very often people avoid eye contact. I don't think it's because they don't care. I just think it's because they don't know where to start. You know, that's one thing I wanted my girls to know is that you don't have to know the answer to a problem to be a part of the solution. You know, you just have to go. And if you feel led towards someone or something, just make that first step Mm -hmm. and then let it go from there. People contact me all the time and see me and say, you know, I I want to share my story, you know, and I love that. And then we do. So let me ask you, what does a day in the life of Jenny DuPaul as it relates to project kind look like Elizabeth, you mentioned that she's out on the street every night in Newark delivering sandwiches by herself, which is absolutely accurate, like every night for the past seven years. But what is your day like? What is your day look like when you're working for Project Kind and the people that Project Kind serves? Each day, I really try to be intentional about letting my heart lead me and and following that pull, like I talked about, that I feel towards something or someone. I don't have a great plan for the day, really, but I do now run the Kindness Closet, which is now an extension of Project Kind, and that's our space where people are able to share what they have and drop it off, like all those donations. And then we open it up to the community and people can come in and take what they need for free. So I'm running that. And then we have groups and people who come in and, you know, make the sandwiches or write the kind notes or, you know, volunteers. And then at night I go out and I deliver those to people who are needing them. Who need them. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, even in my nights in the outreach part, that mobile street outreach, when I'm sitting with people, I'm not just, you know, handing them a sandwich and walking away. I, I really am sitting with them. And for me, it's, you can meet that immediate need, but there's something about that interaction that so much can happen with that, mm-hmm. you know, if you're open to it. So I, I really try to build on the relationships. It's taking that extra step, right? It's not just yeah. a matter of feeding your belly, but feeding your soul. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And then also, you know, we focus on the people in need. So it is people who are experiencing homelessness, but also families that are facing eviction. Maybe people have food insecurities. Maybe their electricity has been shut off. Yeah. So we get emails every day from families from all over the country saying, you know, you know, we've been following you and we're facing this hardship and could you come? And I will like, Mm -hmm. I'll fly wherever. And Mm -hmm. I want, you know, I want to meet them. And then I kind of put their story out there and I see if anybody can meet that need, creating those opportunities for people to come forward and be a part of someone's journey is also really important. It is. You talk about that all the time, being a part of the journey. Let me ask you this. This started very, very grassroots. What have you found has been the biggest challenge in scaling, I guess, and a nonprofit organization? With Project Kind, we're really trying to fill in the gap where maybe other social service agencies, a lot of the time that are bigger, they're not able to maybe keep up or maybe somebody isn't meeting the requirements that are needed for them to be served. By that particular agency or wherever. So these are the people that are a lot of them. Yeah. That has always been my focus. You know, I, I like to help the people who have tried everything and for whatever reason, the way the system is set up, their needs are not being met. Their needs are important and they're worthy of having these things. So those are the people we've focused on. So for us, really the monetary piece is, is difficult. 
that's the biggest need is really money. I, I mean, you've got tons yeah. of food and clothing, but I think the challenge of every nonprofit is financial resources. Like I said, I, I do what I can where I can. And I was thinking back to when we did our very first outreach, mm-hmm. me and Lily, Annabelle. Your um, daughters. Yeah, we served four people. Mm-hmm. And I know through COVID last year, I think we served 75,000, well, closer to like, eight, yeah, about 80,000 people. And that's not because of me, really. It's just giving people a way to give that's doable for them. They will. Yeah. And every give is equally important, whether it's a sandwich or a hundred thousand dollars or, you know, (laughs) you're going to touch someone's life. Sure. I want to give Jenny a second before we wrap up here. She's always involved in, you know, she went to Texas last year in the winter when they had the huge ice storm and there were tens of thousands of people in the freezing cold without power. You've raised money for hurricane victims. You have a a bureau over in Africa where you're building schools for children. You're always, as any nonprofit is, looking to raise money so you can serve more people. You've got fundraisers coming up and you also have a book that's coming out as well. So if you want to talk about those two things. Sure. Yeah. The fundraiser is going to be on December 2nd. And then the book is called Why Kindness Matters. And I think one of the cool things, and I'm going to ask you to let people know where they can get more information about both of those, but I've been to a number of Jenny's fundraisers and there's always, she always has people there who have been impacted by Jenny, obviously, and by Project Kind. So people that have moved from homelessness to housed and people who have been impacted. It's just remarkable to hear them sort of witness for mm-hmm. what Project Kind does. But where can people get more information either about the fundraiser, perhaps they'd like to attend, or perhaps they'd like to donate? And where can they buy the book? So projectkind123.org is the website. So mm-hmm. the fundraiser information will be on there. And then whykindnessmatters.com is the website where people can pre-order the book even. Mm-hmm. We have these brave women on this show today. So I wanted to hand it over to Victoria and say, Victoria, what are your thoughts on this. Amazing what she's been doing kind of like all by herself. That actually shows you the power of a mission, like purpose-driven project, like the Kindness Matters. Uh, I just have a couple of suggestions for you. You know, in retail merchandising, we always offer the good, better, best. I do a lot of volunteer work and I've actually worked with the LA Mission, San Diego Mission, you know, all these missions where homeless people get a little bit of help. Have you thought about raising money like maybe like once a month? Are you in New York or Jersey? New Jersey. Okay. So if you're in Jersey, I mean, it's like restaurant city. So you could do a New York or New Jersey. And if you basically approach some of the restaurants, number one, all restaurants have like things that they can't sell after a certain amount of time, you know, five, six o'clock, they'll know they'll have X amount of bread or, you know, salads, all the stuff that they have to discard. So, you know, you can kind of approach them that way. Hey, we're going to solve your problems. You can take a tax deduction and all of that. But you might take one week out of a year and it could be, you know, have the restaurant people like restaurant years who would participate in them and you would highlight them, you know, you would give them press release and all that. But tell them like, you know, that week, if they order an appetizer, but they don't eat it, that restaurant can donate the money to you. And you'd be surprised how much money you actually raise. You know, people are dining at these places that are 20, 30 bucks an entree. Mm -hmm. And you're telling these people, this is all going to the homeless people. If you get a hit rate of like even 30% of, you know, the diners, especially you just have to pick like 10 restaurants and just really highlight them. And that gives you press coverage to go to press. And it'll give you some awareness of who you are, what you guys do and how simple it is for people to just order an appetizer and not eat. I mean, it could be that restaurant, you know, you just have to pick a course. Like it could be uh, something inexpensive, like like a $10 dish. And that's just how I would go about raising. And if you do that, like uh, restaurant week, for example, or fashion week, I mean, there's all this stuff going on in New York, the Tri-City area. I mean, you still do the, the fundraiser event and all that, but right. you know, you got to be a little creative these days. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Victoria, I've never heard that before, but I would gladly give my dessert to a homeless person. Exactly. <laughs> and for right. those people that really, really want to eat it, um, you know, they could order too. I mean, <laughs> there you one. go. <laughs> It would be such a selfish thing to do to go to those places. And I just have to tell you, I mean, I work with the LA Children's Hospital here, St. Jude's. Um, You know, we did some, when I was at HSN, our old CEO, Mindy Grossman, who is now with Weight Watchers, approached me with the idea of doing Christmas ornaments, like all the designers, There was, I think there was like eight of us, designers gave our time to create a Christmas ornament 
So when they buy something in December for everybody else's gifts, we did this beautiful uh, Christmas ornaments that are like, you know, they were huge like this. They came with the stand. Uh, we got like Swarovski, all this company to kind of donate the materials. I donated my design services. I think there were eight different ornaments, but I think they raised a couple of million bucks because oh they were asking people, you're already buying Christmas ornaments anyway. Just buy it here. It's like $19.99 and all of the money goes to St. Jude's. You know, there's a lot of different ways. When I was at the LA Children's Hospital years ago, a lot of those moms approached me and said, like, you know, most of the moms that are volunteering are people that are so connected. Like they have a kid that's, you know, got terminally ill. Like they're just so emotional. Like they can't talk about it like without crying. So they asked me because, you know, I have a business brain to come and kind of run the whole, like, you know, the fundraising part of this. Th that's like an easy picking because you're kind of working on their guilt trip a little bit. I like it. We have a couple minutes. Kenya, do you have any comments about this? No, I just want to say what you're doing is wonderful. Sounds like you're doing street ministry in a way, right? You're taking goodnesses and you're spreading it along to people. And I'm sure people appreciate that, especially during these times. So I just wanted to just say thank you for what you're doing because it's important, super important. I think one of the things that I could, I'll just jump in very quickly is that this is a challenge for, I think, every nonprofit right now. But you know, the need is so great, especially now during the pandemic, there's mass amounts of people who lost their jobs, food insecure, who are without need. And does that affect donations at all? Did you find that donations decreased? Yeah. So uh, during COVID, I found that a lot of social services weren't running. Yeah. Everybody shut down, you know, so Project Kind was, we kept going, we kept open yeah. because th the needs just came pouring in and yeah. it wasn't the regular people that were coming to us. It was this whole other group. Now it was people who have never really faced a financial challenge before. And now here they are, they've lost jobs. They've gotten laid off or it just opened us up to a whole other group of people. So the needs grew. So did the opportunities for people to come together, mm -hmm. communities to come together together and share what they have. So we just kept pushing forward. Yeah. So we just kept sharing it, sharing the needs, sharing the stories. I kept, I was out every night still through COVID, you know, seeing people on the street that have never been homeless before and people gave, they gave, you know, the food, the clothes, all of those things, the monetary donations that kind of remained the same though, Yeah. you know, and we've had so many offers and people requesting um, project kinds in their areas. Right. And there's so much potential for us to grow, but with that, people are going to want to get a salary. Like not everyone's yeah. going to do this the way I've been doing it. And it requires hiring people and overhead and all of that. So we could grow, but we definitely need that monetary piece yeah. um, figured out. Projectkind123.org. If you really want to impact a life and you, here you see the person who's absolutely going out and doing it herself, please donate. Please look it up. Come to the fundraiser. Buy the book. This is a wonderful thing that she is doing. So we'll be right back after this message. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you wanna know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, Contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Now it's time for Kenya Gibson's segment, Power Move. Kenya, who's our Power Move today? Today we have rapper and young entrepreneur Josh from YNC. So if you're not familiar with him, he's a very well-known figure in the music sphere. And now he's made a power move and a step ahead of his game by collaborating with Jojo Simmons, who's the owner of Celebrity Boxing, which has become this major entertainment platform. And he's actually landed his first fighter, which is Sam Wright from Growing Up Hip Hop, to participate in a celebrity boxing match that's going to be coming up in November. It's set to be one of the most talked about events of the year. And if Sam wins, he'll be the lightweight 
hip hop champion. So exciting things going on in the world of celebrity boxing, which is a whole thing now. So do they do dance moves during their boxing? It's funny. I, you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> not, that I've, not that I've seen, but it's been this really cool blend of music and sports and very entertaining. Carrie had mentioned earlier in the show that Lamar Odom had done one. And there's a bunch of people yeah. who are just hopping on this whole bandwagon of celebrity boxing and finding other ways to build a platform and content. So it's pretty interesting and entertaining to watch some of them, actually. <laughs> They're not really boxers. Some of them. They don't get to hit the face, right? Because these people are no, they really they really fight and they're really not good, some of them. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh my God, is it worth a check? Like I just you feel so bad after watching some of them. But people tune in, they, they like it. So it's like a real thing now. But I know you were gonna talk about Fireside as well. Right. So for those of you who haven't heard the show before. I started my own startup called Fireside Directory. It's a video directory of small businesses online. And I have artists and authors too, where I've been interviewing people and putting them on my YouTube channel and my website. And I have nonprofits too. So I've been building this and I filed a couple patents on it last couple of weeks ago. And now I'm getting my website redone because the website I have, I don't really like. And so I'm on to the next step of a new website and trying to get this in shape to really start expanding it from here. Awesome. So we have coming up on the show today, Bilal Abana, and he is the founder of the Single Origin Food Company. And I was saying that it's the world's first single origin food company that provides ethically sourced organic non-GMO produce direct from the farm to your table. So welcome to Passage to Profit, Bilal. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, excited to hear all about your what you're doing with food. Tell us. In essence, what we do is we, we believe in people's right to know where their food comes from. And although you can get, um, you know, vegetables which are locally grown and fresh produce, we realize that my co-founders Colin and Mo, we realized about six or seven years ago that there was a big gap in things that we ate that which weren't fresh in identifying where they came from, um, whether it's your rice, your sugar, your salt. And those base products, knowing where they come from, are just as important as the fresh produce, we believe. So we're the world's first dedicated single origin food company. There are a lot of people who do source directly from specific places, but that thought process forms our decision making on everything we do. So how does the process work? You'll find something for instance, a farmer in Pakistan, right? And then what happens? So uh, Colin, who's my co-founder, and the uh, inspiration behind the whole single origin concept, I'll just give you a little bit of a history. So Colin developed adult epilepsy in his early 40s. And in order to balance his medication, he started drinking coffee. And in his strive for a better cup of coffee, Colin found uh, single origin coffee. He knew where it came from and he could lay claim, you know, prove the claims that they made, whether it was organic or fair trade or whatever. So Colin thought to himself, "This uh, I should feed my kids single origin food if it has all these benefits. And his search only turned up cocoa, coffee, tea, and wine, uh, which is uh, was no diet for uh, three growing girls. Uh, and that was the light bulb moment. And Colin, with a lot of belief in um, charities and philanthropy and giving back and helping people, came to myself and Mo for business inspiration and how we can help him take or as a group, take this project from a, from an idea uh, into practice. And um, that's how it started. So at the beginning, it was led by the rice farmer um, that needed help that uh, rice is a very heavily commoditized product. So the aggregators and the people used to pay the farmers very little money with farmers making losses in, in lots of cases and uh, without a voice or a way to share their product with a wider audience. So they were forced to sell to the people who, who purchased it. And uh, we do our research, make sure that they care about the things that we care about. No child labor, no slave labor, uh, organically grown uh, and certified where possible, non-GMO. And we set on the process then of creating a supply chain for them. How can we get it out of the country? How can we create a distribution model, which brings everything uh, here to the USA where we package and market and sell the products. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, it's amazing that you bring up rice because rice in the U.S. is full of arsenic because of all the pesticides that were used in the 80s and are now in the runoff. And rice takes up arsenic better than almost any other plant because it grows in water and it's going into baby food and baby food is now toxic. And rice is one of the first things we give our babies. And I think that's causing things like autism personally, but there's no 
science to back that up yet, but there is science to say there's a lot of arsenic in rice in the U.S. So it's really interesting that you brought up rice first. The other thing is that rice is very heavily aggregated. So we go to the grocery store and we pick up a bag of rice. And I did it once at one of the big box chain stores, I think is, is, the, is the right term for it. And uh, it said comes from one of five countries and it had a list of five countries. And for me, as soon as you the, the alarm bells that ring in my head is if you can't identify which country actually came from, then what else can we not? identify is correct like you said what the arsenic levels has it been tested yeah i mean we're living in a processed food phenomenon and and i think the work that you're doing is just so important and so needed especially with the farmers because they're like our teachers our doctors our healthcare workers like they're so key to just our life cycle and like being healthy so what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in the processed food space that you're trying to overcome with this you know, I would say almost platform that you're working on because you're really kind of changing the origin of like how we learn about our food and where it comes from. Just to address your point about farmers, which is super important and probably the key driver behind what we do. And farmers represent, I think, the highest percentage of suicides globally of a single profession now, because what's happening is as there's less and less money for individual farmers, their kids do not want to continue doing what they're doing. And they're going into inner cities to try and get better jobs and unfortunately not being able to have the level of education needed and becoming homeless, causing bigger and bigger problems. And it's it's a massive knock-on effect. And when it comes to us working with farmers, we categorically believe that giving back to them and helping them grow is important. So if you um, take the old proverb, which is give a man a fish and he'll eat and teach him how to fish and he'll feed his family forever. And I think going back to what Jenny does and how important just teaching him to feed his family is, I believe it's it's a basic human, right? It's not a luxury to giving him the ability to feed his family. My personal mantra is that proverb should be modernized and taken a step further. And then it's once he is able to fish, we should teach them how to sell their fish. And that then breaks the status quo. It enables them to educate their children. It enables them to go from a sustenance position to a position where they could thrive and grow and do things like we are given the opportunity to do through a more sustained education and a society that can help us do so. With regards to the challenges we face on a daily basis, and I guess as we started with rice, sugar and salt as our base products, and we did that because processed foods have become such a massive part of society and the nutrition isn't the same as it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. And therefore we eat foods which we believe should fill us up because we're not getting enough nutrients. Obesity has become a problem. So the lack of nutrition in our food has become an issue. And we wanted to strip it down to the basic things that people eat. We were under no um, false pretenses that we would be able to change how people ate. So we wanted to give the basics that people ate, which is rice, sugar, and salt as a starting point. And how could we give them the best quality and the most nutritious versions of those base products that's what we started and it's education is key and that's our biggest challenge as a, as a small company getting the the news out there and educating people getting people to understand how they impact whether it's farmers lives their own lives and how making small decisions like what they purchase off the retail shelf can form much bigger movements so Victoria, do you have any comments or suggestions? Yeah, I found that this whole conversation really interesting because I'm pretty sure that every woman, you know, all over the globe, in America for sure, you know, so many people, when they buy something that's labeled organic, they think that you're safe, you're not going to get cancer, you're doing above and, you know, above and beyond for your family. That's not necessarily true. And, you know, that reminds me in my jewelry business, there's this thing called a conflict-free diamonds and all that. And there's a huge discussion now ever since that movie, Blood Diamonds came out. By the way, that movie is actually pretty true. I'm in that business. You know, they'll tell you things like, oh, you know, whenever there's a discussion between lab-grown diamonds, you know, imitation diamonds and then natural diamonds, the diamond industry will tell you that we go to the hardest hit places, the most economically disadvantaged places, the poorest countries in the world. And my argument to them is, you've been mining diamonds in Africa for 2000 years. Why are they still poor? I mean, shouldn't they be ruling the world by now? You know, why are they still poor since you're helping them so much? And like you said, there is no way they can trace every single diamond coming out of 23 different African countries where they're cut, because where they're cut, it's all mixed up. That when they give you a piece of paper saying that, you know, this is guaranteed conflict-free, there's no way they can guarantee that. 
So I hear you when you talk about the origin, like the rice and the sugar and all that. I just think that you're doing, you know, wonderful work because it's not a small decision. All of us, our families, we eat, you know, sugar and salt in everything, whether you go to a restaurant, uh, you know, or you cook at home. And that impacts directly your family's health. And I agree with you, Elizabeth, that there is a huge explosion of autism cases suddenly in America. I mean, it's, it used to be kind of like such a slim chance that a family would have like more than one child with autism. And yet, I mean, autism is really on, on the rise, huge rise. And I think that has to do with what we eat. It's just my opinion. It's not a scientifically proven thing. But, you know, anything I can do to help you, um, Jenny or Bilal, just, you know, let me know when it comes to getting the word out, press. I mean, I think that's both of you are doing some amazing work. And I also agree with you that every life, I mean, if Jenny impacts one single life, that's worth everything she's doing. I mean, it really is. Categorically, we're of the same thought. And again, extend to Jenny and maybe we'll have a conversation offline how we can help. But for every product we sell, we feed the child. We have a lunchbox program in Kenya. It's not just a meal. We rent land, we grow food. The schools become self-sustainable so they can grow their own food and they barter to buy things that they can't grow, like oil and so on. We now have a school that's fully sustainable and we're moving on to the next one. The other thing I wanted to share is that usually the people who suffer, so either the farmer gets a good deal and then the consumer pays heavily to buy a product, or the farmer is really squeezed or neglected in order for the consumer to get a low product. And we're not a nonprofit. We call ourselves a fair profit. So we take what we need to continue to grow the business. And we give the farmers over and above what they can get in their local market. And we offer the products at affordable prices. Our goal isn't to be niche. Uh, We're trying to go mainstream. Uh, And just over the last year, we've COVID hit us as much as they did everyone else and supply chain was an issue in packaging and and various other things, which gave us the opportunity to work with our farmers on how could we innovate and provide new stuff. So we started with the basics and now we launched this year our Vegan Unhoney, which was our first product, which attacks environmental issues. That's excellent. So where do people buy your products? Oh, in a host of places. Um, We're we're about to launch our online stores within the next uh, two to three weeks, but you can get some of our honey products at Sprouts and Whole Foods foods nationwide in uh, Safeway Albertsons have our salts and our rices. If you're up in New Jersey, there, there are a lot of independence stores that cover our stuff as well as Shores and in the Northeast, HEB in Texas. So look for the label, the Single Origin Food Company. And do you have a name for your website where people will be able to find you online? www.thesofco.com. T-H-E-S-O-F-C-O.com. Excellent. I love what you're doing. I would love to know where all my food exactly is coming from. I mean, I buy cage free eggs, free roaming from free roaming hens. Hens, I always wonder, (laughs) is that true? You know, I'd love to go see the farm. So anyway, you're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. We'll be right back. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. Protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. It's Passage to Profit. If you missed this amazing show with wonderful people doing wonderful things in this world, you can hear it on our podcast tomorrow. You can see all these gorgeous people on our YouTube channel. Right now, we're going to go through who's been on the show. So what did you think, Kenya? That was a great show. And we ended up talking about one of my favorite things, which is food, but like in a really positive, <laughs> and uplifting way. So I, I love the conversation and the dialogue. And, and I just feel like the common theme of the show was just like goodness and really creating uplifting opportunities for people. And we had Victoria on today, which was amazing. We always get good gems from her. So all around a very well 
rounded show. And you can find Victoria at victoriawick.com. That's V I C T O R I A W I E C K.com. Or you can find her on LinkedIn and check out her jewelry too, because it is really cool. And then we had Carrie Barrett of Carrie Barrett Consulting. That's K E R R Y B A R R E T Consulting, who interviewed Jenny DePaul with Project Kind which feeds the homeless, but also besides feeding the homeless, that's kind of a worn out phrase. She sees them as human beings and treats them as people. And that's almost more important. And you can help her by going to projectkind123.org. And she can always use your help and donations to expand her ministry. And then we had Bilal Albana, the single origin food company, T-H-E-S-O-F-C-O dot com. If you want to know where your food comes from as a consumer, he sources food from farms and knows the whole story. So you really are getting what you think you're getting when you're buying food. But he's also helping farmers around the world stay in business and make their farm successful. The business model he has is really amazing. So I do need to ask Victoria for any final comments. I just want to leave with this because I think this applies to both uh, Jenny and Bilal. Their mission, I'm sure when they first started, whether they thought about this or not, seems impossible at times. You know, we all have entrepreneurial thoughts like, oh my God, why did I get into this? Because it's so hard. Whenever you get to those thoughts and all of you who are listening too, think about it this way. I'm always inspired by Nelson Mandela's quote. And it says something like, it all seems impossible until it's done. So, you know, when you put that into context, here's somebody who's been in there for like 30 years. And, you know, he still had these dreams about changing the country, the world, and he ended up doing that. So when I listen to that, I think no matter how impossible it seems, no matter how high of a mountain you have to climb, not doing it is not even an option. So you better get your rear end moving and start somewhere because it will get done if you really, you know, have that purpose. I was always inspired by that quote. Excellent. Carrie, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I do. I mean, I feel like the theme of this show has been um, how to make the world a better place. That is such an overwhelming thought. And it reminds me of a story. And I appreciate your quote, Victoria. The story is about a seashore, a beach that's been washed a flood with starfish. And there's somebody going along and picking up a starfish one at a time and throwing them back into the ocean. And somebody else sees them and says, there's hundreds of thousands of them here. How do you expect you to make a difference? And the person who's throwing them back says, well, I just made a difference to that one. And so it's like, you can take these small pieces and it doesn't feel like much maybe, but those little steps each day make a difference to someone, even if you don't see it directly. So make those steps. Excellent. And I want to thank Kenya Gibson for filling in today. So if you want to be on the radio or if you want to advertise, Kenya can help you. And she's an amazing creative person. And she's, she just helps everybody. Like she's certainly within the spirit of this show and you can find her at Kenya Gibson with a P at iHeartMedia.com. So we want to thank Noah Fleischman, our producer at iHeart, Alicia Morrissey, who is our coordinator and Chatterboss, who does our video editing and the whole iHeart team. And thank you again, Kenya. Oh, thank you. It was so nice to be here with everybody and always a pleasure to fill in for Richard. So thank you for the opportunity. We'll be back next week. Don't forget to find us on social media, Passage to Profit Show. 